Oh my. You know, um, I'm going to pray in a minute because I need to uh, always come before God before I uh, share his word with you. Um, I think I've told you before that I, I enjoy watching Bob Ross. Any of you guys out there, joy of painting folk, you know, the, the white guy with the afro, does that help from PBS? I know I'm a little older than some here, not as, but if you know Bob Ross, he's the happy painter. Uh, it's very cathartic just to watch the, the program because of the soft tones of his voice. He's a very positive guy uh, as well. Uh, he has all these little sayings, though. And if you watch Bob Ross a lot, you'll, you'll remember the sayings. But one of it, he's a painter, if you don't know Bob Ross. Um, but one of the things he says is there are no mistakes. There are no mistakes, only happy accidents. And so he'll even purposely, sometimes in a painting, he'll purposely make a mistake. You know, if he's trying to put a bush or a tree or he says, don't worry if you do this, right? And he'll make it, look what you can do with it. So the reason I'm mentioning all this is uh, as I prepare my messages, as I build my, uh, and I'm praying with the Lord about how to present his word, I don't always anticipate everything that's going to be happening. And my point of, of saying that is if, if I had anticipated that it was going to be music fest today, um, I may not have... Uh, chosen children and choices because there's most of our kids are you know over there but I want you to raise your if you're not a kid would you raise your hand anyone you're not a kid you're somebody's kid <laughs> tricked you didn't I tricked you so what I'm trying to say is there are no mistakes there's only happy accidents and I just have to believe that even though I, I didn't quite anticipate and plan that we would have a little bit of a different a combination of, of uh, people here, even if you're visiting or whatever brings you here, I, I just believe that God has something in store for you, something in store for you. And I, I, pray, that, uh, I pray that you can uh, be seeking that as we journey together in God's word. So let's speak to our Heavenly Father. God, as we continue in our worship, uh, we have prayed, we have sung, we have given, we have uh, shared a story with our children. Uh, we have fellowshiped and studied. God, as we continue in the spirit of worship today, we do pray a blessing upon uh, Music Fest and, and all the celebration and enjoyment that is happening uh, right next door to us in the gym. We just pray that that would be a blessing. And we also invite your presence and spirit to continue to be with us in our service uh, today, Lord. Uh, we know that there is uh, always an opportunity to draw close to you and to hear your voice speak to us. So we just ask that now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you so much. You're probably familiar somewhat with uh, the verse from Joshua. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and truth. Joshua tells us, put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt. I don't know if you've ever noticed that before. Um, when the children of Israel were slaves in Egypt, they didn't necessarily maintain a religious purity. Over the period of time of being slaves, they allowed the pagan elements and the, the natural worship of that uh, area to affect them, and that's partly why God had to bring them out, because Joshua says even the people in Egypt uh, served other gods. But he says, but serve the Lord. If it's disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve. This is one of the verses you love to talk to uh, um, uh, Calvinists about, right? Calvin, you know, Calvinists that believe there's no free will, basically, that everything's predetermined, and it's a, a fine conversation, but this is one of those verses where the Bible says, you have a choice. Choose for yourselves today whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then the immortal passage that we uh, put on plaques and in our, our houses, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It's a very beautiful declarative statement, isn't it? Let's just say that together. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, just saying it, there's power there. Just opening your mouth and, and just declaring it, um, there's power in the word, isn't there? And when we speak it, it, uh, it, it does affect us. Me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Well, that is our agenda and our goal and our desire with our lives when we accept the Lord Jesus Christ, and we're going to continue exploring that. Now, again, as I mentioned, there are no mistakes, Mr. Ross taught us, 
They're only happy accidents. I know we only have a few young people here. I normally, for our guests and visitors, I have a little interactive time that I usually have with my messages. We're called a kid's quiz. And we have the kids um, help by uh, getting us into the topic of the day. Um, I'm going to open it up a little bit. Can I, George, would you be my microphone? I think if we just have one. I know we don't have a lot of young people here. So we'll let, uh, we'll let other kids, older kids, also help us out with the kids' quiz today. Is that okay with you, Drew? Are we all right together to do that? Drew says we are in good shape, folks, so I'm going to move forward with that. So let's get into the story a little bit. So before Ishmael and Isaac, we've been studying the life of Abraham and uh, trying to learn lessons about family and, and marriage and things like that. Before Ishmael and Isaac, who was the closest to a son to Abraham? Who was in his family that might be closest to being his son? And the hint is, it was his nephew. Do we have some help over here, maybe? Oh, yes, we have a young child named Edwin. <laughs> I think he had a lot of nephews. A lot of nephews? Ah, you're doing a play on words there, aren't you? Okay, if you remember this story, his name is Lot. Now, I put Eliezer's name up there first, and then I lined it out, because it's very interesting when Abram talks about who his inheritor is going to be in Genesis 15, he doesn't mention Lot, does he? He says, a servant born in my house, he's, he's trying to understand God's promise. He's saying, God, you've promised that I'm going to have a, a great, uh, I'm going to have a son and I'm going to have generations are going to come for me. And from my family, you're going to bless the earth. That's your promise. But, but Lord, I don't have any kids. And he says, the closest thing to a child that I have is a servant born in my house named Eliezer, which just begs the question, why didn't he mention Lot? Why didn't he mention Lot? What happened? Why is it Lot? Lot is his actual blood relative. So uh, that's an interesting question. We might look at it later. But up until this point, the closest thing to a son to Abraham is Lot. And by the way, how many of you have nephews and nieces? A few of you have nephews and nieces? I love my nephews and nieces like they were my own kids. I don't get to see them as often as I would like, but I love to do it on them. Nephews and nieces are, are not you know, like secondary. Of course, you've got to honor the parents and, you know, let them be the parents. But uh, if you're a family-oriented person, which I, I hope you are, you can treat and love your, your nephews and nieces like they're your own, and that can be a beautiful thing. All right, number two, why did Abraham and Lot separate? Okay, in the story we're going to look at today, they separate. Why? Is it because they got angry? All right. Is it because, man, they were so rich, they were too poor, or did God tell them to? They got angry. They got angry. What, what is your name again? I'm so sorry. Gianni. Gianni. You know, I should remember that because it's close to Gio. Is Gio's name Giovanni? So we've got Giovanni and then Gianni. Awesome. Do you ever go by Gio or is it just Gianni? Gianni. Okay, I want to I wanna make sure we got it. Thank you so much. No, the, actually, there was some issues there, but it wasn't so much that they got angry. But that's a good guess. Is there anyone else? Anyone remember the story? I hear some of you saying it. Say it loud in the back here. Ah, thank you, sir. That's right. It's actually a, a, a crazy thing to think that a family would separate because they got too rich. But does that actually happen in families? Some, does money separate us sometimes? Sometimes, a lot of times, money becomes something that separates us. So that's what happened in the story. So where did Lot go? Egypt, Babylon, Jericho, Sodom, and Gomorrah. Where did he go? You remember? Raise your hand. We want, you know, we record our services, and if uh, people at home or are watching live or want to watch it later, it's good that they can hear. So anyone want to raise their hand so George can help you out with the mic? Irv, you want to help, don't you? There we go. Irv is, or oh, we got one right here. On the fields of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah. It's Amelia. Is it Amelia? Amelia, thank you so much. Yeah, we, we know it as Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible also calls it the cities and plains, uh, or excuse City me, of cities the of the plain. There are actually five cities, but we, we commonly just uh, refer to it as the two uh, that are uh, highlighted, Sodom and Gomorrah. All right, last question, George, and then okay. you, can, uh, you can relax. If Lot's mother had been there, would she have said good choice or bad choice? Now, Lot's mother wasn't there, but if mom had been around... Do you think she would have said, Lot, that's a good choice, or Lot, that's a bad choice? What do you think? Was that a good choice or a bad choice? Anyone want to help us out? 
George, why don't you go ahead and say it for us? Bad choice. Bad choice. <laughs> See, this is why it's good to have lots of kids, too, in the service. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Yeah, you know, those of you who know the story, you, uh, you'll reflect that that clearly probably ended badly, but God was still there. And this is why. The Bible says that the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly, and sinners, don't miss this, sinners against the Lord. Now, as I mentioned last week, how many of you were here last week? Half dozen of you, a dozen or so? Okay, so uh, you might want to pick up, uh, go on YouTube and watch because last week, because there's going to be some dovetailing between last week and this week. As we talked about last week, though, Abram was living in a pagan world. Okay, he comes from a pagan world. So things like idolatry and slavery and polygamy and hedonism and, and things that within the, the, uh, the, world, uh, the, the perspective of God would have been ungodly were happening everywhere. The land of the Amorites was filled with people who sacrificed their children in the fires, who worshipped idols, who practiced slavery. But there's something different about Sodom and Gomorrah. There apparently was at least some knowledge of the truth that existed in Canaan outside of the family of Abraham. And we learn this in Genesis 14. If you remember the story of Genesis 14, after Abram saves Lot, he meets somebody and pays him tithe. Remember his name? Melchizedek. Some of you remember that story. Melchizedek was a priest of God, of the true God not part of the community of Abraham. So there were certain individuals, there were certain groups that had some knowledge that God God wasn't just trying to reach people through one family. God had his, his, his angels and his spirit trying to save everybody, okay? So there were other pockets, there were other ways that God was trying to connect with people in this area. And I think from this statement, you can derive the idea that in Sodom and Gomorrah, God had tried to bring the truth in because their wickedness and their sin wasn't out of pagan ignorance. They seemed to have been sinning with knowledge, knowing what God had called them to do, and yet having that high-fisted sin. And Numbers 15 calls about, talks about the sin where you basically shake your fist in the face of God. That's what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's not just a, an ignorant pagan culture that just doesn't know any better. Okay? By the way, that was a bonus. That was for free. That's not even part of the message today. So, um, but, but it is important to know. So just as a reminder of kind of what the, uh, uh, the, the, the sermon series has been on, talking about how God wants to establish His plan through the family. And God, through the family of Abraham, is trying to set a an example for everyone to follow from to understand how God wants to bring about strength and order and the gospel message through the family. And this is one passage that we looked at, or one statement from Spirit of Prophecy. One well-ordered, well-disciplined family tells more on behalf of Christianity than all the sermons that can be preached. Pretty powerful, isn't it? If your family's in order, then God can work through that. God speaks through that. If the family is in disarray, the message of God is not as easily discerned and seen. So that's why it's so important that we understand that not only in our nuclear family that we have at home, but within the broader structure of the um, church family as well. And then last week when we looked at the marriage of Abram and Sarai, or Sarah, just keeping it simple, the close and sacred relationship of God to his people is represented under the figure of marriage. These relationships are not just conveniences to the human race. They're not just for our our benefit and pleasure of building families and having stability. The message and promise of God is communicated through our family, through our marriage, through our children. And that's why Abram and Sarah are such an important uh, family to study. So what about our children? Kind of moving through different family structures. What about our children? A couple of things to uh, whet our appetite from Review and Herald. Those who love God should feel deeply interested in the children and youth. Uh, Do you love God? Are you deeply interested in children and youth? The servant of the Lord said those two go hand in hand. We cannot neglect, we cannot uh, uh, turn away from the priority and the, the, uh, the, the, the necessity in our Christian life. Not, and I don't think she just means our children. 
I think she means the children that we have the opportunity to influence and come into contact with. The love of God should naturally produce in you a compassion and kindness so that when you are in the presence of a child, you take deep interest in their success and their salvation. And, uh, and just look at the life of Christ. Did he turn away from children? He loved to be among the children. And we want to be like Christ, don't we? That's what we're doing as, a, uh, as, as Christians on our journey to become more like God. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Frederick Douglass, one of my favorite people in all of American history, probably one of the greatest speakers, orators that ever has lived in America is Frederick Douglass. Even reading his speeches, they are so moving. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. Each day of our lives, we make deposits in the memory banks of our children. And again, you're all children. And we are all uh, affected by the experiences that we have and how we can learn. Every child you encounter is a divine appointment. West Stafford is the founder of uh, Compassion International. He wrote the book, Too Small to Ignore, an amazing individual, amazing story. Every child you encounter is a divine appointment. I think that's true. Now, this one made me laugh when I read it. The soul is healed by being with children. I don't know if Dostoevsky met the kids I know, but <laughs> that's what he said. And I think if you think of it in the, as broad a terms as possible, as optimistic of terms as possible, um, you can always see the value and what that, uh, what that can be to you. The soul is healed by being with children. One of the greatest authors that's ever lived, Dostoevsky. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I have a couple of Russian kids I should ask. Oh, Betty, where are you? Okay, I got to get the thing she wrote for me. Rabin Taranath. Tahur. Tahur. It's, I've been trying to get it right. This is a, an Indian philosopher and poet, uh, very uh, famous in the, in the 20th century. Every child comes to you with the message that God is not yet discouraged of men. I like that. I like that. Every child comes to you with the message that God is not yet discouraged of man. Rabin Taranath <laughs> Tahur. Tahur, Tahur, Pratiba, I'm so sorry, Betty, I'm doing, I'm trying, trying to get it. We'll call him Robin, okay? God is not yet discouraged of men. If I could relive my life, I would devote my entire ministry to reaching children for God. You know what, what I think this one is significant, Dwight Moody? Probably the greatest evangelist that's ever lived. Millions and millions of Christians who gave their life to Jesus would point to Dwight Moody and say it was because of his dedication. Millions of people accepted Jesus Christ because of Ira Sankey and Dwight Moody. And yet Moody would say by the end of his life, if he could change it, he would devote his life to children. I think that's powerful to have the, uh, such a successful Christian say, I, I would change. Pretty amazing. A child is a curly, dimpled lunatic. I think he meant that uh, in a good way, but I thought it was funny. A child is a curly, dimpled lunatic. Dr. Seuss, adults are just outdated children. Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. You know who said that? God did. In the Psalms, God tells us that. Throughout this series, I've, I've, I've tried to emphasize that God wants to bless your family. He loves to bless. That's the promise of Abraham. Through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. God wants to bless you. 
Okay? And then last week I talked about how God wants to bless your marriage. God wants your marriage, your relationship, the intimacy that, that, that God wants to produce through that, that relationship. God is excited to bless that. And God wants to bless your children. God wants to bless his children. He talks about how a child, and, and all of us are children, we are, are, are not just accidents, we are gifts. And it's a reward, it's something that God produces uh, within the community of the family that we should be very uh, excited about in our families and in our church. Children are a gift, and that gift is something that God wants us to learn from and appreciate. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Genesis 13. Genesis 13. But just some opening observations about uh, the, the chapter, just so to uh, freshen our, our memory of it. After the shame of Egypt, that's what we talked about last week, Abram returns to Canaan and turns back to the Lord. And we'll look at that. And then Abram grows exceedingly wealthy. Lot, Abram's closest relative, makes a terrible choice, but God reaffirms his promise to Abram. So that's kind of the, the basic idea of Genesis 13 but we want to spend some time studying that together. Most of the verses will be on the screen, but you're welcome to look in your Bible as well. So this is how it begins. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev. That's the southern desert of Israel, okay? He and his wife, okay, and all that belonged to him and Lot with him. Now, if you remember from last week or if you just remember the story of their experience in Egypt in Genesis 12, it did not go well. At the end of Genesis 12, they're escorted out of Egypt. They actually said, you're not welcome here. You have brought a curse to our community. You have lied to us. You have not done uh, uh, right by us, and we don't want you here. And the tragedy of that is they were supposed to be a blessing. The tragedy is that they, God's calling to Abraham was that you're to bless the places that you go. But as a result of uh, their, their, their fear and their doubt and their lies, uh, a curse falls on Egypt so that they're kicked out. And, and the thought that came to me with this, it says Abram went up to Egypt with, uh, with his wife, is I wonder what that car ride home was like for Abram. Have, have you ever really embarrassed your spouse uh, or your girlfriend or maybe just your best friend? Really, really embarrassed them? Did they, did they let you know about it? Are they still letting you know about it? Well, I wouldn't know anything about that. And my wife isn't here to... <laughs> To Peshaw me. I don't think that was a happy journey for the community of Abram. I think that was a, a time of, of reflection and probably some apologies and some embarrassment. You know, Pharaoh had put Sarah into his harem. That's where she was living during that time. I don't think that was an exciting uh, moment for them in their family. And we talked about. So they leave Egypt, they leave kind of with their tails between their legs, and now they're coming back to the promised land and trying to figure out what to do. And Lot is there with him. We're going to talk about Lot. There's a big part of the chapter about Lot. Abram was very rich in livestock and silver and gold, partly because of the blessings that Pharaoh had done for him. He increased his wealth. His worldly value went up because of his lies and shame in Egypt. Okay? So, but he, had, he was already a mighty chieftain, and he leaves, and he's very wealthy. He went on his journeys from the southern desert, the Negev, as far as Bethel, to the place where his tent had been at the beginning, between Bethel and Ai. So he's gone now a little bit north of Jerusalem, if you want to think about your, your, your Bible maps or something like that. He's now in the heart of Canaan. This is where he originally came when he uh, uh, received the call of God to leave the land of the Chaldeans. He comes over, and it says he went to the place of the altar, which he had made there formerly, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. This is what I think is going on. Abram is now recommitting himself to God. Abram is going back to that place where he had once made a commitment, and out of, out of his own fear and out of his own uh, 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 selfishness, he had abandoned the plan of God and brought negative things to the community of Egypt. So he's now coming back to the place where he had first made that promise in, in Israel, and I think he's recommitting himself to God. Isn't that what it means when you go back to the beginning and you call on the name of the Lord? I think this is a strong moment for Abram. That's my point. He is reassessing, reevaluating, and recommitting himself to the plan of God. 
He went there to that altar which he had made formerly, the place where he'd begin at the beginning, and he called on the name of the Lord. So the, the story starts out reaffirming the strength or the desire of Abram to be faithful to God and not to lean on his own understanding. Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, and the land could not sustain them. I want you to notice that. The land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions uh, were so great that they were not able to remain together. I think it's important to remember, when you really get into the context of the Bible story, to try to, try to understand as much as possible. Sometimes when we picture the patriarchs, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, we, we picture kind of a small community of a family with maybe a few servants and few small flocks and herds. Abram was not a small community. We read in the next chapter, when local kings go to war, that when Lot is stolen, Abram raises an army of over 300 individuals from his own community, said that they were born in his house, meaning that their parents were also in his community. They were old enough to fight, so they may have had their own spouses. My point is this, even to maintain the numbers that the Bible reveals, the, the community of Abram had to have been in the thousands, okay? The, he was not just a little nomadic guy meandering his way through the land of the Amorites and the Canaanites, okay? He is a mighty, powerful chieftain. He confronts the combined forces of several kings in, in Genesis 14, okay? So he is a, an, an incredibly important individual in Canaan at this time. A massive nomadic community is the family of Abram. Again, it's just good to keep these co things in context. So when it says the land could not sustain them, I don't think that's an overstatement. I don't think that, again, to have a massive community of thousands and then Lot, he's developing his own wealth, he's developing his own family. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say these two groups were probably growing beyond the regional ability to sustain them so that they were not able to remain together. Now, this brings several questions to mind, though. Abram and Lot grew so wealthy, or they're so blessed, right? They're blessed by God that they have to separate? That is not normal. That is not typical, even for the community and the culture of that day. You normally would never separate, okay? Uh, uh, the, the, the other patriarchs, they would maintain their children, their grandchildren, as three, four, five generations would try to stay together. You would almost never separate from your blood relatives in, in, in the dramatic way that Lot and Abram separate. This is not normal. And the question is, why would they do this? What was happening that the closest thing to a son, keep that in mind, the closest thing to a son that Abram has at this moment is Lot. Lot carries the potential, at least in the mind of Abram, of potentially being the one that God could answer the promise for and bring for uh, other generations if, if he considers that he's kind of adopted Lot or something like that. So the fact that they come to a point where they've grown so wealthy that they have to separate, I don't think is normative, nor do I think the Bible is saying this was the right choice. It's just simply saying the reality. Who sustains us? Is it the land that sustains us? Is it our wisdom? Is it our wealth? What is it that sustains us? The Bible says the land can no longer sustain them. But is that where we should uh, uh, turn when, when we grow so rich? What do we do? Do we need to separate? The Bible says it's God who sustains us. Behold, God is my helper. The Lord is the sustainer of my soul. Cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never allow the righteous to be shaken. But you have sustained me from my birth. All throughout the Bible, we even call him Jehovah Jireh. You guys remember your Bible names? All the names for God? Did you ever study those? How many of you know what Jehovah Jireh means? The Lord is my provider. Even his very name means the sustainer, the provider. So the fact that the Bible says the land could not sustain them is an indication that they could have said, well, the land can't sustain us, but God must have a plan because I don't depend upon the land for my being sustained. I depend upon God. Does that make sense? 
think about it and let me know. <laughs> that God wants to be our sustainer. And this is an indication of the problem that is developing here. Is this Abram's first test of being a father? I think it might be considered his first test. What will I do about my nephew? And is this Lot's first test at being a man? I think that might be kind of what we are examining here in Genesis 13. Notice now verse 7. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. So obviously you're in a climate, there's limited water, limited pasture land. Hey, it's my turn to have the water. No, it's my turn. It's Lot's flocks. No, it's Abram's flocks. So they are getting themselves into a position where they can no longer, uh, 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 they're, they're getting, they're fighting about it. And then you have this interesting passage at the end of verse 7. And I'm telling you, I, I've read a dozen commentaries on this. There's no general agreement, but I'll, I'll tell you what my thinking is. Right after it says there was strife, it says, now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling in the land. And you think there's a, why did, remember, who's the original person who wrote this story? Moses. So the first generation to get the story is the Exodus generation. They're listening to these stories that Moses is writing in the book of Genesis. And Moses purposely writes this. Now there was strife between the people of Lot. There was strife between the people of, of Abram. And by the way, they were living in the midst of other peoples, Canaanites and Perizzites. Canaanites were city-dwelling people, people that actually settled and built permanent settlements. Perizzites were the tent nomadic people that were traversing just like Abram. So it acknowledges that there are other people there. And the question is, why is that important to know? And there's all kinds of theories about why we need to know that. I'll tell you what my theory is is because it's the same thing as what happened in Egypt. The purpose of the family of God is to be a blessing to the community that you're in. Are you hearing? The purpose of God blessing your family, the purpose of God building up your family is not just so you can say, thank you, Lord, for my riches. Thank you, God, for all my opportunities. Thank you, God, for all the talents you've given me. It's so that you can translate those blessings so that the community that you're in also gets to experience the blessings of God. And when the family fights, the blessing is lost. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite were in that community and they're not getting blessed because they see that the family is fighting. Notice these verses. The beginning of strife is like letting out of water. Abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. Again, in Proverbs 20, verse 3, keeping away from strife is an honor for man but any fool will quarrel. And then in the New Testament, conduct yourselves with wisdom towards outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. I think Moses wrote that the Canaanite and Perizzite were in the land because he's saying that they're not going to be able to be successful if they're fighting. Their purpose is to be a blessing, and God wants to bring his message to the people that they interact with. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your, your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Very interesting, very powerful statement for, for Abram to acknowledge the close kinship that he has with his nephew. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I'll go to the right. If to the right, then I will go to the left. Very magnanimous of the elder to give the junior the opportunity to choose. If Lot had been in a right mindset, Lot would have said, no, uh, Uncle Abe, really, you decide. You're, you're, I wouldn't have anything without you. I mean, I followed you out of the land of the Chaldeans because God called me as well. But Uncle Abe, you choose where to go. That's what he should have done, right? But instead, Lot goes, oh, really? You let me choose? Really? I'll, what, okay, I'll choose. And this is what I'm, I'm, I'm wondering about as I go through this. What was Abram thinking? Um, now, I believe that Abram is in a good place spiritually because he's committed himself to the Lord earlier on in the chapter. And then right after Lot separates from him, it also says that God spoke to Abram and reaffirmed his promise to him. So I think Abram is really trying from a, from a heart of, of, of purity and, and strength to do the right thing. Maybe he was thinking he was going to end the strife, and in, by so doing, he would protect God's image. It's not good for us to be struggling together. Uh, if we need to separate in order to end the strife, we'll do that. I don't think he was trying just to protect his own image and wealth, which is what he did in, in Egypt. I think what was more likely is he knew that Lot was determined to separate anyways, and he was honoring Lot's choice. How old do your kids get 
before you start letting them make their own decisions. Even when you know those decisions aren't good. How old? Let's see, I've got a 21-year-old, an 18-year-old, and a 15-year-old. I don't feel right about it yet, quite yet. But the time does come when we have to honor our kids' decisions. And we have to trust that God will still be there. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan. It was well watered everywhere. That was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, Moses reminds us. Like the garden of the Lord. Interesting that he mentions the garden. Like the garden of the Garden of Eden, of course. Like the land of Egypt. So now two chapters in a row, Egypt has been introduced into the ideas and the journey of Abraham. As the children of Israel are hearing this story, having just come out of Egypt. Like the land of Egypt. This is very similar to what happened to Eve in the very garden of Eden. When the woman saw, notice that Lot saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. You have almost a verbal parallel between the two. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw, just like Eve lifted up her eyes and saw what she thought was good, but in actuality, it was an evil in, in, the, in, in uh, God's plan for them. The tree was desirable to make one wise, so she took from its fruit and ate. They're not thinking of God when they make these decisions. They're thinking of themselves. Abram seems to have understood that Lot had come to a place that he needed to make his own decisions. Even if Abram knew or worried that those decisions might lead to mistakes or suffering, he honored Lot's choice. Abram trusted God and let Lot go. How old do your kids have to be before you honor their choices and let them go? <laughs> but the promise is God never forgot about them. God was watching out for both of them. Even though Lot doesn't make a good decision here that we know, God does not abandon Lot. Twice God will rescue Lot. Twice God will reach out and rescue Lot. So Lot chose for himself. Even modern translations of the Bible translate it this way, and I think it's done on purpose, right? What did Lot choose? He chose for himself. All the valley of the Jordan, the Lot journey toward east, eastward, thus they separated from each other. Again, I think it's painful when our kids make choices or when we as children make choices that separate us from each other. And that's the decision that Lot made. I'm going to separate from the family of faith, and I'm going to pursue that which looks good in my own eyes. Abram settled in the, city of, in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley, moved his tents as far as Sodom. The men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. Lot put worldly things ahead of spiritual, just like Eve did. Lot was already rich. It says that. He was so vastly wealthy, he could no longer even uh, be in the land. He was already rich, but he didn't think to himself, I have enough. I want to stay within the family. All he thought about is, but maybe I can be more rich. He was already rich, yet he wanted more, just like Abram did in Egypt. Lot chose for himself. That's a definition of sin, isn't it? Whenever you put yourself first, that's selfishness and sin. That's what Satan did. Lot separated from his family rather than reform his life, which is what Cain did. Now, God ordered Cain to separate, but if Cain had been redeemable, God would never have sent Cain away. Cain chose to remain in that position so that he had to separate himself from the family. But if Lot had simply said, I will do things, I will do what is necessary to stay within the community, he wouldn't have been put in that position of traveling to a city and a land that would jeopardize his future and ultimately uh, kill many of his own family. God did not abandon Lot. Amen? When you make bad decisions, does God abandon you? When your children, even if they're adult children, 
make their own decisions. Has God abandoned them? Of course not. Of course not. This is the story of what's going on here in Genesis 13. Man, our, our, our world is so different. Every day it's just amazing the, the different challenges that we face. And kids face enormous challenges with the decisions they make. Think about this one alone. What, what, what is, how many decisions every day does a child make about what they're going to do with this? It's, it's a different world, and every day they're making decisions. And we want to guide them. We want to provide examples for them. We want to be good uh, leaders for them. God never abandons our kids, even when their choices are not the best. Our role is to set a good example for them and help them make the best choices possible. Everyone here is a kid. You are already rich. Church, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, if you have made him your Savior, you are vastly affluent. All the promises and richness of heaven are yours. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance in the saints. Don't put riches ahead of your relationship with God or your relationship with your family. You're already rich. Jesus tells many parables of this. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in the field, which a man found and hid. And again, from his joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has to buy the field. Heaven is the treasure, and it is yours by the promise of God. And you should have enormous joy from knowing that God has promised you that. It's worth everything that you are to obtain that, and God promises to give you that. We're already rich. Don't choose the world over the family. These are the lessons and the messages we want to embrace ourselves, but also teach our children. Don't choose the world over the family. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another. That's what Lot did not do. He should have said, Abram, you're the elder. I need your guidance. I want you to, I'm giving you preference. But he failed when he said, I'm going to do my own thing regardless of how it affects anybody else. Give preference to one another in honor. Do not love the world or the things of the world. All that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the eyes, the pride of life, that's not from the Father. It's from the world. And the world is passing away, also it's lust. But the one who does the will of God lives how long? Forever. Don't choose the world over the family. And ask yourself, am I choosing, when I make decisions, am I choosing for myself? Or am I putting God and my family first? Of course, we know what Jesus tells us in the New Testament. The two great commandments, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and the foremost commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Don't choose for yourself. Choose for God first and for your family first. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Make no provision Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Don't give it a, a foot in the door. Am I choosing for myself? Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all these things are going to be added to you. If we can teach our kids these simple lessons, and if we can ourselves embrace them, I think we'll have a much more successful relationship as a family, both in our individual families and in our church family. You've heard this verse before. God says, I have no greater joy, no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. That's what we want for all of our kids, don't we? And that's what God wants for us because we're all sons and daughters of God, to be walking in the truth. Would you pray with me as we close? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another opportunity to dig into your word, to fellowship and worship together. 
Help us, dear Father, to continue to learn from these stories. Help us to look at it through your eyes and to see not just the, the narrative of the story, not just the uh, what's on the surface, but to really try to get into the depth of why you've enshrined these stories for all time so that we can continue to learn from them. Whether we've studied them once or many times, you continue to teach us. So Lord, thank you. Thank you that we can talk about these things together. Give us strength. Help us to be a family that is putting strife out of our experience and that we are doing everything we can to support one another. Thank you, Jesus. We pray in your name. Amen.